Things are pretty messed up from the beginning. A woman named Carol dials 911 and claims that somebody's inside her house. So we go to investigate, searching the place inch by inch, but we find nothing. Usually this is explained away, you know, the mind of an older person living alone, eventually it starts deteriorating. The onset of dementia, other mental issues, they start to take a toll on their lives. It'd be quite, quite sad, really, you know. This woman, however, she's only 24. So in other words, the probability of this all being inside her head, it's extremely unlikely. She also seemed to be terribly distraught by the whole situation. I mean, why would she be acting, right? Well, we leave her place. We tell her to contact us if she sees anything again. I mean, couldn't really do anything at that point, right? So we were somewhat surprised when we got another call from her the very next day. We drive down there, we search the house again, we find nothing again. Problem is, the house seems different this time. You know, almost, almost as if there's been some subtle detail that made it a separate place from the one that we were searching yesterday. My partner, Beck, says that he noticed it as well, but he, he doesn't quite understand what's wrong. We decide not to say anything about this. As, uh, we tell Carol that we came up with nothing. However, she tells us to stay. I recorded him, she says. She takes out her phone, tells us to watch the video that she pulls up. There was footage of her in the house. She's running around, she's breathing frantic. And then... We see him, a large figure, covered head to toe in what appears to be a, a black bodysuit. He lumbers toward the camera as Carol screams and ducks into a room, locking it from the inside. There's a few bangs on the door before we can hear footsteps walking away. We don't, we don't know how to react to this footage, yeah, but we try anyway. You know, we come to the conclusion the man must have left once Carol got behind the door. However, the front door was locked when we came, and Carol told us that she hadn't left the room. Did he also have the keys to her house? And that, would, that would explain a lot. But it also made the situation a lot worse. And we decided to keep an eye on her house for the night. We're discreet, parking about a block down the road in an unmarked car. We're both fully awake, ready to go as soon as we see some sketchy shit, you know. Around 2 a.m., we see somebody walking across the road towards her house. However, this isn't the man. It's Carol. It's Carol herself. Beck and I must have had the same look on our faces. What the fuck, you know? So we get out of the car, we make our way over there. We knock hard on the front door. Now nobody answers. But we can see lights flickering on and off intermittently. We're not sure what that's supposed to mean. Was she trying to tell us to leave? We get a call from dispatch a few moments later. They're telling us Carol... Carol called 911 again, says there's multiple people in her house. They ask if we need backup. We say, we say yes, right? So without, without another moment of hesitation, we force the door open and we barge in. Living room lights are still flickering on and off, but we see the light switch. Nobody's touching it. We call out for Carol. Nobody responds. In fact, the place is dead quiet. I can see the neighboring houses starting to turn on their lights from the commotion. We rush up the stairs. We start sweeping each room. There's, there's nothing. You know, once again, we we search the place inch by inch, but there, there's nothing in here. Not even Carol, who we clearly saw enter a few moments earlier. As I pace around, in petrified confusion, Beck speaks up. There's rooms here. That shouldn't be. What the hell are you talking about? I ask in response. So I've been counting, he says. There were nine total the last time we came. There are ten now. You didn't notice? I, I forced myself to think hard. Subconsciously, I, I knew there was something off. But I couldn't pinpoint exactly what. However, I realize. Basement. There was only one door down there last time. Beck nods. Two now. I don't know what to think. I look at my surroundings and try to make an assessment, but there's there's really none that could be made. We hear a knock on the door about ten seconds later. It sounds agitated. We look out the living room windows, but we're not met with red and blue lights. 
were hesitant to answer, of course. I decide to take a step forward, but Beck pulled me back. He looks at me, shakes his head, whispering. We left the door open, remember? He was right. My radio starts crackling, another call from dispatch, telling us that we need to leave the house immediately. Carol called again, saying we were going to die in a deathly monotone voice. The knocking stopped. We could hear footsteps in the basement. Something's, something's in here with us. We decided that that was enough. We needed to get the fuck out of there. So as we start descending the stairs, we hear a voice coming from the kitchen. Carol comes out, blocking our path to the door. She looks, she looks detached, with blank, beady eyes staring at us. Did you find him? She asks without any semblance of emotion in her voice. I think he might be in the basement. Why don't you go check? Beck and I are frozen in shock. She just keeps looking at us, gesturing towards the basement door every now and then. The footsteps down there sound like they're running in circles now. We ignore her request. We abruptly brush past her, bolting out the front door. Backup still isn't here, so we decide to just get out into our car. However, we see somebody down the street, peering through our driver's side window. He's large. He appears to be dressed in, in a black full-body suit. He looks away from the window and directly at us. It's hard to tell from this far, but the suit doesn't seem to have any eye holes. Beck speaks up. Sir, please back away from the vehicle. His voice cracks in the middle of the sentence. He's terrified. As soon as Beck stops talking, the figure starts running towards us. It's fast. It's too fast. In the time it takes for us to pull up our guns, we've realized it's actually moved past us and into the house. We waste no time running into the car, locking the doors, waiting until backup arrives. When it finally does, we're extensively questioned while what appears to be SWAT searches the house. However, this isn't the police chief asking us. It, it's some guy in a suit, a guy we'd never seen before, asks us things like how many doors were in the house? Like, what did Carol look like exactly? Did we ever see a man with one eye wandering around? We answer inconclusively to pretty much all of them. We have no idea what the hell's going on. At one point, we see SWAT members carrying multiple stretchers outside, loading them onto their truck. Not an ambulance, mind you. Their own truck. And eventually, the man who was questioning us tells us to go home. Report to our station as usual. He tells us not to worry about what we've seen here. I mean, I don't know how he expects us to do that. We drive back to the station in complete silence. As we park, Beck finally lets out a sigh. Jack's fucking crazy, dude. I, I look at him in confusion. What are you talking about? Who the hell's Jack? He reciprocates an equal confused stare. The hell are you talking about? The dude who owns the house. What? It was a lady named Carol. How'd you forget that already? We hold each other's chaotic gaze for what feels like a minute, but we say nothing further. We both silently exit the vehicle... We start heading our separate ways home. We both know that something's terribly wrong with the other. Oh, I, try, I try not to think about it too much as my head hits the pillow and I manage to drift off to sleep. It takes me about three hours. Only to be woken up immediately by the telephone, barely coherent. I answer it. We need you. A woman dialed 911 says that somebody's in her house. My heart sinks slightly. It sinks completely when she tells me the address. It's Carol's. I hang up the phone and I slump into bed. I just want this nightmare to end. Hey there, kids, it's me, Mr. Creepypasta, and I wanted to wish you a very well, we're getting close to October. <laughs> Are you as excited as I am? Also, thank you for watching tonight's video or listening to tonight's episode of the podcast if you're listening on Spotify. The summer is finally coming to an end, and that means we're moving into the fall. And as we get further into the fall, for those of you that live in cooler climates, you'll probably like to have a nice cup of tea. To get a nice cup of tea, my wife sells it. It's at etsy.com slash shop slash ivory monocle tea. You can get a whole bunch of different teas there, including creepy pasta based teas. My personal favorite is the Dark and Stormy Night, which is why you can get a sticker of me on it. And if you do buy that one, you can always ask for that sticker of me doing a little dab. And you get a special dab sticker. 
Also, I want to give a very big thank you to all of my Patreons over there on Patreon, because you guys have helped me out quite a bit. Like, not I get, not even quite a bit. You guys are like, honestly, you guys pulled me out of an incredibly dark place when I first had to look at moving and all of the demon stuff that YouTube does, and thank you guys very dearly for all the help that you've given me. People like Jordan Alexander Sanchez, Brian Arce, Bobby Carmen, Stephanie Butler, Tristan Pelton, Chase Burnett, Diana Krause, Raven Mitz, Satanic Aries, Ness69420, also Dotrade, Payne, Nessie, Blitzkrieg, Bardo Hawk764, Melancholy Corpse, Ferb, Harley, Billy Morrow, Madam Skullbunny, Sashi Suzaku, at Grizzly Olsen Pro, Caden the Spooky Boy, Zane Nightshade, My Body Sounds Like Rice Krispies, Ashwood, Lord of the Weebs, Jay, Fay Lockett, Miss Sander, Mr. Unsettling Spaghetti, Suji Campbell, Azarine Fox, Robert White, Fried Chicken 12, James Bruce, Freddy Krueger, Ty Nanny, Michael Scarborough, Infernal One, Lisa Cottrell, Caspian, Jordan Nels, Hades Nephew, Tater Chip, Acid System, Prozac and Pancake Appreciation Society, Cryptic Nightmares, Kiri the Sloth, Tommy Green, Liam Newman, Sky Harbor, Caleb Dougal, Nina Smith, Nico Kyle, Rafael Rodriguez, The Ginger Bros, Aaron Stormcrow, Daniel Polson, Trace Miles, and Corey Kenshin. Once again, thank you all so much to everyone who is in this list of names that I mispronounce and everyone who's in the description and everyone who supports me at patreon.com slash mrcreepypasta. I can't thank you guys enough for listening, for watching, and I wish you all sweet dreams. Good night, everyone.